So, uh, conductive anodic filamentation, uh, basically uh, you build a circuit, you build a system, uh, it runs, it works fine, and then suddenly, abruptly, it fails, and it fails completely. Uh, so you get a short circuit between two features on a, on a circuit board, for example. And what's happened is, um, the system has been exposed to, of course, uh, um, um, a bias, so there's a voltage gradient between two points on the board, so a plus and a minus. There's some temperature involved, usually, and there's humidity. What happens is, uh, the humidity, of course, goes into the substrate, into the base material of the uh, of the printed circuit board that's being used. Um, within that substrate, there are also uh, some an some ions available, so some conductive particles and bits and pieces that can be can be picked up by the humidity and dissolved by the humidity. So you form a kind of miniature plating cell, and the bias, of course, drives the um, drives the reaction. Temperature, of course, increases the rate of the reaction, and eventually, a little filament grows from from the the anode to the cathode um, on the uh, on the circuit board or inside the circuit board and this little filament grows and grows and grows and grows and, and, and like a plating cell basically until eventually uh, this pathway turns into a conductive uh, filament that actually shorts the circuit board out that's my guest alan morgan next on reliability matters welcome to reliability matters a podcast for the electronic assembly industry each episode covers topics related to reliability best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. My guest today is Alan Morgan. He is a technology ambassador at Ventec International Group. Our conversation today is all about cars and the increased reliability expectations associated with their electrical systems. The electronics in modern vehicles provide an unprecedented level of safety, not just for the driver, but for those people and objects around the vehicle. Because our cars go in and out of harsh environments, the circuit assemblies within the car are subjected to heat, humidity, and other sources of moisture, which contribute to reliability and therefore safety. We'll discuss one of the primary failure mechanisms of circuit assemblies, an issue that can affect the reliability and the operation of the safety systems within the automobile. It's a real issue that, for many, is not well known. I spoke with Alan from his office in Scotland. Alan Morgan, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining me today. It's my pleasure, Mike. Well, uh, before we get into the uh, reason I invited you on the show, which was a, an article um, that, that you wrote, which just really caught my attention, uh, let's talk a little bit about Alan Morgan. You are a technology ambassador for Ventec. Uh, tell me, A, what is a technology ambassador? I love that title. And B, what is, uh, what is Ventec? What's, what are they all about? Well, technology ambassador really is a, is a job title that, uh, and a job that fits me perfectly. Um, I really enjoy technology and I like going around meeting people and talking to them. So uh, these are the two, the two functions that come together with the, the ambassadorial role, I guess. Um, I spend my entire working life um, in printed circuit boards and primarily in printed circuit board materials. Um, so I retired a few years ago after uh, more than 30 years with one company. Um, and um, Ventec, uh, who is a, a laminate manufacturer as well, based material laminate, laminate manufacturer based in, well, oh, based in China, but owned uh, owned um, by a Taiwanese company, they're listed on the Taiwan Stock Exchange, is a is a is a very vibrant, uh, growing company with a lot of speciality areas, and some of those areas include um, uh, low loss materials, high speed materials. Some include IMS materials, so insulated uh, metal substrates for for thermal management. Some include an automotive sector. So a real whole range of things that uh, attracted my attention. So my my job basically is to um, talk to people, which uh, I, I do. I travel around the world in my other role as the chairman of the European Institute of Printed Circuits. Uh, I go to all the major trade fairs uh, and I give lots of papers around the place and that's what I've been doing for Ventec now. So really trying to uh, promote some of their products um, and actually feed information back to the company as well about where the uh, where the market is moving, where the growth sectors are, where the technology is moving. So it's a role that works both ways. Um, I'm working with some old friends um, and I'm working with a company that's, that's very dynamic and I think that's uh, the bit that I, I really enjoy. Uh, Ventec is present throughout the world. I mean, they manufacture in China and in um, and in Taiwan. 
but they have uh, an own supply chain throughout the rest of the world, through Europe and also through North America. So they have a global footprint, um, but with a, as I said, a very nice range of products, which um, you know you could say are, are niche products, but they're they're pretty big niches, and um, you know there's a lot of scope for uh, for technological technological advancement within their product portfolio. So that's the bit I I really quite like. Yeah, very good. And I think any company that embraces the concept of a technology ambassador, someone to go around and <laughs> and talk about the technology, not necessarily and not exclusively um, about the company itself, but about the company's technology. I think that is a, a very wise, forward-thinking move on their part. It's it's nice as well because I, I, I don't get involved in commercial discussions or, or the you know the operation or the management of the company at all, which in the past I did I did used to do in my former employment, but now I can focus on technology alone, which is something I really enjoy. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, a metallurgist, materials technologist by, by training, and right. uh, I love the technology and always have. But in my career, I've been involved, of course, in many other things, in man management as well, and some operations in the past, some businesses. But actually, the technology is what I love. And getting back to technology alone is, uh, is a real pleasure for me. So that's, uh, that's why it really fits for me. And I, hopefully, it fits for Ventec as well. Yeah, very good. Now, you mentioned that uh, Ventec is actually headquartered in, out of Taiwan and yep. uh, listed on the Taiwanese, Taiwanese Stock Exchange. Does yes. that, uh, if their manufacturing is also in Taiwan, does that get around any any potential tariffs? Uh, they have manufacturing in Taiwan and in China. I mean, obviously, the, the tariff position has been, uh, has been an issue, uh, I think, for all Asian manufacturers. Uh, although, of course, there is manufacturing in Taiwan, which, which gives them some relief. But, uh, yeah, the main manufacturing is in China. Right. Taiwan's no more the control the, and the, oper the, the management. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but there's also a factory there. Uh, there is also a factory there. But um, um, certainly, the tariffs have been an impact. I think everyone's been impacted by the, you know, even the unpredictable nature of, uh, uh, of the tariffs. If I was looking at some figures just recently showing the, you know, the, um, uh, the scale of the tariffs now is pretty, is pretty scary in many ways. But uh, anyway, nonetheless, it's, it's being dealt with, um, you know, in management, I guess, in, in business, you have to deal with things that are thrown at you. This is completely outside of the control of our industry. It's being imposed for other reasons. And uh, I think it's remarkable how people have managed and, and found, found ways around this and continue trading around the world because we need, you know, we need to trade around the world. It's essential that um, supplies and goods uh, pass between the different regions. Uh, we have different specialities and different market sizes and market needs. So um, that way has to be found. And I, I've always found business to be pragmatic. Unfortunately, governments tend to be rather dogmatic. Yeah, that's that's true, which forces businesses to Without be pragmatic. Brexit problems. <laughs> this is not a, you know, a political show by any means, but I, I, uh, a couple of points. Number, number one, um, I think the whole issue of tariffs will soon be resolved um, one way or the other. And I'll let people read into that what they, what they hear. And uh, I, I think a lot of people really don't have a good understanding of what tariffs are. Tariffs are not paid by the manufacturer. Tariffs are paid by the buyer, by the purchaser of the product. Um, and, uh, um, you know, hoping that the, it'll drive the product up to a price where the manufacturer will have a hard time selling them. But it, it really is, uh, you know, the, the residents of the, the users of the product, the residents of the country uh, that impose the tariff that actually pay those tariffs. But business has a way of, of overcoming and uh, businesses are are quite uh, pliable, and uh, they they see what's in front of them, and they and they adapt very very uh, chameleon like. And what I found in this particular case um, is, you know, the tariffs are, you know, do have an impact. There's no doubt, and you know, the the price pressure is uh, is something that that gives a lot of uh, a lot of headaches to many people. But you find the businesses find ways of cutting costs elsewhere, so they they adapt to some degree to accommodate the uh, the change in the tariff or the increase in tariff. Um, and of course, when the tariffs do get removed, which will happen eventually, you know, I, I agree with you 100%. There will be a resolution. Of course, the gains that you've made in accommodating it stay. So actually, uh, there is at the end the end point. There's actually a benefit, even though it feels pretty painful as you're going through it. So well, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm confident we'll come to the end point and actually things will be better again and things will work, work fine again. And whatever the winners and losers are, you know, I think in the end, um, uh, the consumers will, uh, will get a better deal in the end and it'll all be good for everybody. Right. And I think the manufacturers, I'm not speaking specifically of Ventec, I just mean in general as a business move. I remember when the airlines uh, were hit by, by suddenly rising fuel costs, they responded yes. by charging for luggage and and uh, charging for to, to, to pick a seat and charging for seats right. that weren't the worst seats on the plane but they weren't anywhere near the best seats on the plane they came up with all these tools to um, uh, bring in extra cash to make up for the rising cost of jet fuel and of course when jet fuel came back down to a normal price 
<laughs> the, we're still paying for bags and and yeah, and sure. Bad they seats, all right? yeah. It all stayed, so it was probably good I, for business overall. Maybe not quite as good for the consumer. I, I, I was thinking the other way around, sort of rather than you know finding new things to charge for. You know, in our business, uh, supply chain is a large part of the cost. Then the uh, and there are things you can take out of the supply chain cost. You can you can do all kinds of things to to make that leaner and more agile. And actually, those things uh, by reducing the cost because you're forced to because of this this position you find yourself in, uh, those things uh, also, you know, give benefits later to you and the customers. So everyone benefits in the end. You know, sometimes it needs a thing like this to, to push you to to make a change. You know, you don't make the change normally and you, you don't feel the pressure. But once the the margins get get hit, the customers are, are crying and, uh, you know, tariffs are hanging over you. You've got to do something. And people find the most amazing things to do to fix things up they would never have thought of normally. So, uh, right. you know, there can be benefits, even though it's very painful. I know it's painful. I've been there myself. But um, at the end of it, you say, yeah, actually, you know, I wouldn't have done that had we not been under the pressure we were. Right. When we had the, uh, you know, what our, our grandkids will grow up being taught was the Great Recession uh, <laughs> of 2008, yeah. 9, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, our business was hit by it, as was every sure. business on the planet. And we adapted. And, you know, part of me, you know, I, you know, in the big picture, yeah, I wish we never went through that. But part of me can at least recognize the value of going through something like that because we became a better company. We became uh, leaner. We became much more efficient. We had, we, our, we adjusted our, our view, our forward view. Um, so, and we became healthier in, in the long run. And uh, so, you know, part of that experience, although it was painful at the time, uh, was, was valuable. And we are today, you know, 11 years out, um, mm -hmm. a better company, yeah. a stronger company than we were before. Right. And I'm sure all those companies that did survive it are now even better off than they were before and, yeah. and will be less affected by these types of things in the future. I think it's come to mind. I mean, one, one saying is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I mean, that's um, something that you could imagine would be, yeah. um, you know, relevant here. The other thing that I mean, I, I love I love old sci-fi films. And you think of the, the film The Day the Earth Stood Still, um, yeah. you know, something I use when I, I do coaching sometimes for, for, for companies. And, um, you know, there basically the message is, you know, nothing changes until you're looking over the precipice and then then you can change. So, you know, there are there are many things we can learn from the past as well. But I think, you know, humans are amazingly resourceful. And um, we see that across technology as well. We also see it in business practices. So, you know, if you're forced to do something or forced to find something to improve, people do it. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's wonderful how people have done that over the, uh, you know, this, this great uh, recession, as you, as you called it, which we're still feeling the effects of. You know, what, what happened in 2008 is not over. You know, we still, we still suffer as a result of what happened. Uh, but yet, those who survived are stronger. Yeah, yeah, definitely still feeling the aftershocks of that. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this article that you wrote for Printed Circuit mm -hmm. Design and Fabrication. It, it, uh, it, it definitely attracted my attention because it hit on a couple of things that I have a passion for. One is cars, uh, the other is electronics, and, and the third is the reliability. It was all wrapped up into one <laughs> nice article. And the title of the article, which appeared in August of this year in, again, uh, Printed Circuit Design and Fabrication, uh, is, will self-driving vehicles sharpen our focus on reliability? The nature of ADAS, ADAS, could revive uh, CAF fears, conductive and motor filament fears. There's obviously a lot of acronyms in that, in that short title. Uh, tell me about the motivation for the article and your experience with and your concerns about uh, self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, and, and reliability as it, as it pertains to that subject. Well, the cafe sort of came in there as, as a reliability feature, but I mean, I think the thing we have to think about is is the way that our experience of driving and vehicles is going to change. I mean, I mentioned ADAS, your advanced driver assistance systems, in the the, the, the start of the of the, uh, of the article, and of course, we're used to these things now. We have the you know the automatic braking, we have the uh, collision avoidance systems, we have the uh, you know the blind spot detection. All these kind of things are there. We have, of course, limited uh, self driving, of course, in vehicles. So that's uh, that's all going on. But I'm thinking sort of. A, a bit further down the line from there and how the model will change. Um, certainly for me, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I wanted a car and, uh, you know, the car gave you your freedom and gave you your, uh, you know, your, um, um, I don't know what the word is, mobility. So, so a, a car was a, a major, a major coming of age, uh, but actually a car is only a, a way of getting from A to B really. That, that's what it is uh, functionally. 
And I think we're going to come back to that function as time moves on. So rather than focus on the vehicle and the, uh, you know, and the mechanism, people will focus more on the journey. Um, and if you can imagine the position in the future, and in maybe 10 or 20 years from now, when, when vehicles are, are, are automatic, so basically um, you want to go somewhere, you, you plan a journey, um, you tell your, I don't know, uh, Alexa, whatever the equivalent of Alexa is, I want to go to, to San Francisco tomorrow, uh, please get me there. And then, and then these AI systems will calculate the best way of doing that and maybe a vehicle will turn up at your doorstep uh, driverless the door opens up you get in and it takes you the first part of the journey it may take you the whole way it may take you to a railway station it may take you to a, a hyperloop terminal I don't know what the hell it'll do but something along those lines and then you'll carry on the journey so the vehicle um, which you used to own it used to sit on your, on your driveway like 98% of its time only, only ever being driven 2% of the time will suddenly be used a lot and you won't own it anymore it'll be owned by somebody else um, and it'll be doing journeys for lots of people so it'll go from your uh, your application your need to somebody else's um, so there's a there's a bit of a change here because the first thing is um, the vehicle will actually be used, you know, rather than being used 2% of its time, it'll be used a lot more of its time. So more synonymous with, a, with a, you know, a car owned by a, by a hire car company now where they let this thing out, you know, day in, day out. So uh, it gets a lot of usage. It, it racks up a lot of miles in a very short space of time. And that in itself is quite stressful for a vehicle. You know, most vehicles that we own right now, you know, do, do nothing. The only bit that stays powered up is the alarm system. That's the only bit. The rest of it is is mainly off, and it comes on when when we need it here and there. So that's going to be quite a quite a change. This duty cycle movement from you know from having you know two percent uh, uptime and ninety eight percent downtime is going to change to probably fifty fifty or sixty forty or eighty twenty. Who knows where that will go? So you'll have a, a vehicle having a much higher duty cycle of actually being active, uh, which will of course will affect reliability. The other big change is the move towards uh, electromobility. So I think we all know the way this is going now. We're not going to be driving around in gas guzzling vehicles or diesel or what, what the hell um, uh, in the future. We're moving more towards electric vehicles and maybe hydrogen fuel cells will be in the mix there as well. But electrical vehicles, you know, do bring another another dimension to all this. Never mind the control systems, the, a, the ADAS systems, never mind the, um, you know, the electronic function we have in our engines now. These things are driven by motors. So uh, you have... Uh, you have a lot more power, you have batteries in there as well, and then you also have the charging side. So instead of a system that's running at uh, maybe 12 volts or 24 volts or 48 volts, which are the sort of common, common standards right now, you get vehicles running at 400 volts or 600 volts, or you get even testings being done now at over one kilovolt on, on uh, electromotive systems. So that's a massive change, and that's where I, I think you know, I could talk about CAF, um, you know, which is the uh, conductive anodic filamentation. Well, be, before uh, we go down that road, I, I, do, I definitely want to talk about that, because that, uh, that's, that is a problem larger than people realize. Uh, it's, it's one of those problems many uh, manufacturers have, I can't say experienced, they've had that problem yet not actually experienced it because they didn't know that's what they were experiencing. You know, CAF sometimes it forms one um, um, small short. Uh, it may or may not ruin the board, but, the, but a lot of people don't really realize what just happened. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But a, a couple of points. Uh, based on your conversation, on your statements, you know, we talked. You talked about cars will become, you know, a means to an end uh, more than they are right now. Um, that will just hop in a car that that that's scheduled to come by will drive us to another location, almost like a like a subway car um, uh, on the on the on the surface. And I'm just wondering. I, I agree that's the future of cars. And I'm just wondering then how. The, the people who are car nuts, the car culture. The, the, I live in Southern California, and we definitely have a car culture. We certainly don't have a mass transit culture because there's not a lot of mass, mass transit. I live about 40 miles from Los Angeles, and if I were to take mass transit into Los Angeles, it would probably take me um, you know, four hours you know, on various buses and, and, and trains. Uh, it's just we're not set up for that here. We're set up to drive. And because... I live in an area that is that's very car centric. Um, the types of cars we drive uh, speaks to the person. That that's a shallow statement and it's a sad statement, but it's true. Um, you know, people look at the car you drive, the zip code you live in, your area code, and your telephone. All these materialistic things, but it has been wrapped up as part of our culture. Um, and I'm just wondering how the the concept of of 
autonomous cars and and particularly going down that that thought process where we really may not own a car. Maybe we will just have a car like an Uber type service without a driver. We're certainly going to have to make a lot of adjustments um, in parts of the world where cars are are part of someone's identity, um, and and that includes yeah. the way we drive the car. You know, I I live just a mile away from a high school, and and the worst place to be at three o'clock every weekday <laughs> afternoon is on a road next to that high school because all the <laughs> testosterone charged boys looking at the girls walking down the sidewalk. You know, um, it, it, like a peacock with the feathers, uh, you know, their version of the big <laughs> peacock feathers is the accelerator pedal. And and, you know, they spin donuts and they blast the music and, and you know, it's just part of the culture. It's just going to be an interesting transition as cars become really just a, a means to an end. And, and it's a cultural thing. I mean, uh, you know, how things have changed, you know, in, in my lifetime. I mean, I used to cycle to school. You know, I had a bicycle. That's how we used to do things. Um, you know, uh, the school where I live, I, I live in Scotland. I, li I live near a, a very popular school, one of the big private schools in Scotland, you know, where, where my boys went. But every every afternoon, there's like a stream of, of cars that go outside the, the school waiting to pick the kids up. You know, uh, when I was at school, that never used to happen. People used to walk to school. So, you know, cultural changes happen over, you know, short and longer term uh, time frames. I mean, you know, we've only had automobiles for, what, 100 and, 120 years or something, I guess, something along those lines. And ironically, uh, they that. started off as electric cars, mostly. <laughs> yeah, the earliest well, cars isn't it? were electric cars. <laughs> yeah, funny, we, we come full circle. But I guess before that, we had horses, you know, and I guess people would, would show off their horse, you know, whatever they used to do. Um, so these things happen. But I think the, ch the change will be forced on us in the end. I mean, we're, we're being forced away from, from fossil fuels, of course. Um, forced away. I, I say that not uh, pejoratively at all. I'm just saying that basically that's what's going on. Uh, we will eventually run out of fossil fuels anyway, so there'll be a need sure. to move away from, you know, from gasoline uh, as, as a fuel. Hydrogen m might be the, uh, the option going forward or whatever. So there's, there's certainly a change in, in that kind of way of doing things. And of course, we're still being urbanized. You know, the population is still moving from the countryside to, to urban areas. And urban areas, uh, even though I, I fully agree with you, um, you know, mass transit systems uh, in many places don't work. They're, they're atrocious. Uh, urbanization is the first step towards a, an efficient mass transit system. Uh, I live in Scotland. I live in rural Scotland. Um, you know, there's like one bus a day goes through my town or something, or I'm perhaps exaggerating. But, you know, here uh, I, I ride a motorbike, which is a great thing to do, and I have a car and, uh, you know, I have a bicycle and we can walk around. But actually, you couldn't survive uh, uh, on the mass transit system here. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't get you to work on time. It wouldn't get you to where you need to be. But that doesn't mean it can't do, do that. And, and I think, um, you know, if there were to be a mass transit system that worked, uh, people will begin to use it. And I'm thinking of places like, uh, you know, I visit Asia quite a lot. If you go to uh, you go to Seoul, for example, or you go to Taipei, you know, you have a wonderful uh, MRT system that actually actually works. You wouldn't dream of, uh, of taking a vehicle in, in these cities at all. Um, because the mass transit system actually works. It's easy, it's convenient. Uh, look in Tokyo is another good example uh, where, again, it, it just works. Um, it's low cost, it's, it's, it's comfortable, and, and it's easy to, to manage and, and, and work with. So if you can imagine a stage in the future where uh, you know, AI is being used to plan your journey for you, so rather than you having to turn up at the station and try to work everything out for yourself, you, know, you have some assistance from a, an artificial intelligence uh, system that works it out for you and then tells you where you need to be and when and then deals with the rest of it. Actually, it can be uh, it can be quite quite interesting and, and a good way forward. And in the end, then you'll get vehicles, of course, being used for leisure. You know, a vehicle actually the function of a vehicle actually is is is, is to get you from A to B. That that's what it's designed for. But actually, I'm with you. I mean, I I enjoy driving. I enjoy riding my motorcycle. Um, you know, the the actual A to B bit is is sometimes secondary for me. I enjoy the actual experience of the journey. Yeah, so uh, do I. And that's and that's going to change. You know, I mean, although uh, I, you know, it's possible to enjoy a journey on a train as well, um, and some people enjoy very much. Uh, but I think, you know, the, um, as you said, you mentioned before, the testosterone fueled, um, uh, you know, t t tire burning and, uh, and donuts and stuff. That'll still be possible, <laughs> of course, but you'll go, you'll go somewhere special to do that. Right. I live, we'll I live pay for five the miles from the race. Yeah, yeah we'll exactly. And, and, and that part, even though we could do it on the road, but that's getting more difficult now. I mean, uh, I can certainly recall when I was, uh, when I was a young man driving very fast around the place, it was possible these days, if you do that, you know, you end up losing your license because there's yeah. so much technology in place to stop you. So, we are being pushed away from that anyway, and that kind of behavior, even though when we were kids it was fun. It actually, it's not only not fun anymore, it's, it's not possible anymore in many cases. So, sure. so I think we will see that, 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 that change in the, um, 
in the culture and it'll take a while to come through but you know there's many people now we've seen these climate protests in the last uh, the last few uh, few months growing and growing whether we agree whether we don't agree it doesn't really matter you know there is a groundswell of opinion now taking us in this direction and um, urbanization will continue and uh, and I think pressure on uh, on this um, um, this dependence on uh, on let's say um, self-controlled um, uh, transport will will have to change as well and I think it will change maybe not in you know one generation uh, completely but in a couple of generations we'll see probably a massive transformation as we have in the last 50 or 100 years in our, in our attitude towards towards vehicles and um, you know our independence by by using our own our own transport sure before we dive into the uh, the technical side uh, one more point on how uh, we uh, we are just in a full circle environment we talked about um, the first cars in the earliest days were electric and then Henry Ford kind of mm. went over to the internal combustion model and and changed it for you know almost forever until now, uh, in the in the United States on the particularly in the eastern part of the United States, a lot of the uh, electricity generation plants still run off coal, and yes. you know we we burn coal to boil water to create steam to turn turbines to make electricity. So in many respects, you know someone who comes home from work and plugs their Tesla into their garage outlet um, are basically, you know, we come back to the coal days. Uh, you know, there, that is a coal fired car. And if we look at the, the source of the, of the energy used to power that car, the, the source of the source is coal. So we have in many respects kind of come back full circle. You know, we're, we're burning coal to power transportation and, and, you know, we've, we're not doing it in steamships anymore, but we are doing it to create electricity to, to run our lives in many parts of the world. It's true, and uh, you know um, there are many examples of that. China will be another another good one right now. Um, so what you're saying really is, or what the conclusion is, that you're moving the pollution away from the the urban areas to somewhere else where where the power generation plant is, right. and that that's that's a very valid argument. Uh, but of course, coal. Uh, living in Scotland as I do, um, we don't have any power generated by coal here anymore at all. It's completely finished. We closed the last deep coal mine here around seven or eight years ago now. So there is. No coal power here whatsoever. When I was dating my my wife uh, in Scotland, they had you know coal fires uh, in all of the major rooms yeah. and and uh, a little uh, uh, coal uh, closet um, downstairs. And coal would be delivered every week, and and they would stoke the fire. And coal also uh, boiled the water for the immersive for the for the hot water <laughs> heater. And and you just had a coal fire going all the time. And the buildings. Yeah, you remember the, those days. The buildings in Glasgow or Edinburgh were were dark, and they just looked like they were always dark. And then, as coal was removed and and replaced with uh, natural gas and electricity, um, a lot of the major cities started sandblasting their buildings. And my God, underneath that 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 coal you know covered black uh, surface was were these beautiful, lighter colored, brighter colored buildings that we had just you know, forgotten about. In fact, the house I live in uh, has coal fires. Where we, we, we don't use them very often. We use them for burning logs now and again. But uh, I, I actually exposed um, some of the front of the house. It's made of stone. And uh, the, the old part, the Georgian part of the house, which is 200 years old, was actually black, uh, as you mentioned, yeah. because of all the pollution that was around at the time. Right. So, you know, we've, we've come a long way from that. But, you know, yes. there are alternatives now. And, um, Absolutely. you know, um, you think about how much energy comes from the sun, for example. You know, the, the energy from the sun uh, is, is, is being now harvested in, in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, personally, I, I'm a big fan of hydrogen fuel cells. I think this is a technology that uh, that is really, really wonderful and actually fits very well with electric vehicles because you generate direct electricity. You haven't got to generate, um, you know, uh, power to heat water up to make steam to run a turbine, which, you know, still to me seems pretty inefficient. You know, that's how nuclear power works as well. It does the same thing. You know, Absolutely. the heat source is different, but you're still making steam and running a turbine. Whereas a hydrogen fuel cell, of course, doesn't work that way at all. It takes a hydrogen, um, you know, hydrogen uh, in the cell, oxygen from the air, 
there and actually combines those together to create an electrical charge, you know, electrical uh, uh, potential, and that then drives the motors or the batteries. So, you know, there's there's many ways around this, and I think, you know, just to just to move the pollution from the urban areas to to some rural areas or some power plants would be the wrong thing to do, and of course we've done that to some degree, but that's not the end game. The end game is, of course, to make the the power generation clean as well, and in that power, will come. Yeah. Uh, there's Absolutely. no doubt that will come. It's coming. It's a pity, in my in my opinion, and it is only my opinion, uh, that perhaps nuclear power hasn't been. Uh, uh, has had such a bad rap, let me say, because nuclear power has lots of benefits. Um, I understand people are concerned about safety. Um, I understand that. But on the other hand, this is a very clean uh, source and it can, of course, be entirely renewable as well. Well, you so, know, um, not, not to get too political, but I wonder how many people annually die of um, pollution caused illnesses, people with compromised immune systems, things like that, caused by, you know, fossil fuels being burned versus you know, the, the nuclear um, uh, accidents. The nuclear accidents are terrible. They're like well, plane crashes. They, they're dramatic. They, 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 they are magnets for the media, uh, and rightly so. Um, but overall, you know, how many people do they affect? How many lives do they change in a positive way by creating clean electricity? Uh, versus well, you, you take you we take coal mining in general. I mean, my, my my grandfather was a coal miner, and he had scars on his hands, you know, uh, uh, from cuts he'd had down the mines. He didn't see daylight for, for many years. He worked on the, you know, on the uh, underground during the daylight hours. Uh, mining itself kills people, uh, kills a lot of people through through accidents and also through um, you know lung disease, of course. So that right. you know that's a direct consequence of of, mine, of mining coal. The estimates I saw recently were that over a million people a year die uh, in China alone. Uh, uh, through through the pollution caused by, by 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 burning coal, and of course China's dealing with that. China is moving very aggressively away from this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, approach now because they understand that this is a, an issue, and I think all of us um, all of us can learn from that example because you know even though we we think we are uh, living here in the West in developed countries, you know there are you know, significant hundreds of thousands of people dying a year because of pollution in our cities caused by, you know, coal burning or by, or by vehicles right now. So actually, you know, if you take that side of things, how many people die a year from coal as against how many people have died in the entire in entirety of the nuclear industry, you just can't compare these figures. Right. It's a massive difference. Again, it's a political opinion, I have to say, to some degree. But, you know, the facts are the facts. And, um, you know, of course, uh, people are scared about, um, you know, nuclear power plants because it's something that's unseen. And, you know, Chernobyl was a, was a big wake-up call, I guess. Um, for us over in in, uh, in Europe, um, but you know they're few and far between. Like you said, it's it's like a plane crash. When it happens, it's pretty bad, but they don't happen very often. Whereas the coal thing is there all the time. You know, all the time it's eating away and it's causing you know chronic uh, um, breathing conditions to people and, and disease and, and killing people. And so yeah, that's the other side you've got to consider. That's the main advantage of of going with electric cars in this case, because electric cars have the possibility of producing clean energy to run those those electric cars internal combustion engines whether it be gasoline petrol uh, uh, diesel uh, there is you know, we can make it cleaner and cleaner but we can never make it completely clean and so if we stay with internal combustion engines we will always have some degree of pollution if we go with uh, electric we have at least the possibility of having a completely benign uh, from an environmental standpoint, energy source. Uh, to, to I think that's the right way to view it, Mike, as well. That, that's the right way to view it. I mean, we, no, nothing is perfect, but actually that, that gives you the possibility to go in that direction. Absolutely, because we don't have that possibility right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. let's talk about technical stuff. We're going to get back into cars and the nature of your article. You know, one of the things that when we spoke yesterday in preparation for this interview uh, that we talked about was, you know, car, the electronics in cars started off, you know, in, in, in the radio and and then worked its way into other devices. And many of those devices were, they were fun. They were, they, were, they were put in because we had the technology to put it in, but they weren't really life-saving or, or safety-enhancing. They were gimmicky things in the early days. And, you know, the, the ability to unlock your car from a distance, you know, was probably one of the earlier electrical, uh, electronic marvels uh, put in a car. Yet that really wasn't a safety issue. If, if it failed, you can still unlock the door with a key or, or if you're inside the car, pulling up on the knob. Um, and then we got into infotainment stuff. We can listen to satellite radio in a car and we could uh, listen to AM and FM and we can program our stations and we can maybe have even the show, the station name or the show that the station is playing displayed on a screen. And, or we could see our distance to empty. Uh, 
versus just a, a analog gauge. All of these things were interesting and they were uh, they were fun, but none of them we really relied on to you know complete the journey safely. We've now morphed into with the electronics and cars. We've now morphed into a situation where if any of those or or many of those electronic systems failed, our lives are now at risk. So we have in a very short period of time, it, it's like we went to sleep one night and woke up the next morning and all this stuff is in a car um, between <laughs> airbags and uh, adaptive cruise control and lane departure warnings and all this stuff uh, that that keeps us safe. It went from being a novelty to now we rely on it. And now that we're relying on it, we're not driving the car as much as we were before. We are riding in the car more than we ever have before. And now all of a sudden, these electronic systems are important. They are just as important as as an electronic system on a A380 uh, in the air. So tell me about um, the, the content of the article and what your concerns are with electronics, particularly in the automotive world, and uh, what the industry is doing to improve reliability now that it has become more than just entertainment. I mean, we have to be careful on the comparisons here between uh, you know automotive safety and, and perhaps aerospace safety. Um, aerospace safety has a has a number of ways of uh, or a number of ways of achieving safety that uh, are not available to us in in vehicles. For for example, I mean uh, the A three eighty has redundant systems, so you have more than one computer. You have two. You actually have three computers uh, doing the safety critical functions. That doesn't occur in in, in automobiles uh, for a number of reasons, um, uh, because of of cost and because of of weight in some cases as well so um, we have to sort of be be careful on, uh, on on the options that are available to us of course we do have uh, redundant systems on braking for example you know braking is done through uh, through hydraulic systems uh, electronic systems but there's there's usually a mechanical uh, backup so you know if you press the pedal hard enough the hydraulics will eventually slow the vehicle down so some of that goes on but you know we don't have two engine management systems in our vehicle we only have one um, we don't tend to have, uh, you know, mul multiple systems. Uh, infotainment. We have we have one GPS system. We we don't, you know, if that fails, it's not it's not so critical. But if we come to the the stuff that's really important, the the collision avoidance stuff, um, you know, that's where it gets quite interesting now. Um, so many vehicles now have multiple systems uh, around collision avoidance and around driver assistance or advanced driver assistance. So, for example, a vehicle may have a, a, a lidar system, so a laser um, detection system may have a microwave. Uh, Checking for vehicles ahead and checking the profile of those vehicles and vehicles behind coming towards you. It may have ultrasonic systems as well. And it may also have vision systems. And vision systems are actually really interesting because um, the vision system basically is a camera in the front of the car or the back of the car or wherever the hell it is um, with a GPU, so a graphics processing unit that can actually do all kinds of things. So these systems now can recognize um, you know, hazards. They can recognize traffic signs. They can recognize... Um, speed limits, they can recognize roadside furniture. And it's all part of this um, kind of V to X um, concept, which is vehicle to other things, X is other things. So it could be infrastructure, it could be other vehicles. Um, so I think there is some redundancy being built into vehicles now because you don't just have to rely on the radar or your uh, LIDAR system, you actually do have a vision system as well that can be used together with these other systems to, to give this kind of uh, redundancy. Even though they're used for different things, sometimes you've got like the fail safe of the uh, you know, the brakes will come on if the vehicle calculates you're about to crash. And of course, there's a number of um, interesting areas around this about the human interface as well, um, how the human interacts with the vehicle. So I listened to a very interesting um, doctoral thesis recently um, where the this was based on, um, on alertness of the driver. So there was a calculation being done in the vehicle that said, OK, this guy is driving the vehicle now uh, hands-free, basically, so the vehicle is on autopilot. Um, the system, the car was then looking around and deciding on what the hazards were. And it was deciding um, there will come a point where I have to give control back to the human because I can't deal with whatever whatever may face me. How long do I have to pass that control back to the human? Uh, and what state is the human in? So the system was looking at the human, seeing what the human was doing. Was the human sleeping? Was the human with his hands on the wheel? Was the human reading a book? What was the human doing? And how long would it take to get the human back on track to control the vehicle? And it was then deciding at what point it would need to have intervention. So that's quite an interesting development as well. 
well. So um, the the system actually becomes pretty intelligent and, um, and and knows about giving control back as well to the to the human pilot of the vehicle. I found that pretty really quite quite fascinating. Yeah, it is. Uh, General Motors, I think their name for the um, semi autonomous driving mode is called Super Drive or something to that effect. Right. And they actually have a camera built in to the dash yeah. that looks at the driver's eyes and it can yeah. tell if the driver's looking straight ahead or if, if it, so if right. you look to the left or look to the right or up or down for more than whatever threshold it, it sets a few seconds probably it will vibrate the steering wheel or or send you an alert to um hey you know to bring heads you up. Control, right yeah. right yeah, yeah. and i guess yeah. that is so that it can hand over the responsibility of driving back to the driver at a moment's notice uh without having to yeah. you know wake them up and the question is, how long is that moment? How long does it need? And it works out how long it needs, and then knows when it has to intervene. And that's that's pretty pretty smart stuff. And the more we move on, the more AI can can help us with that. And of course, now we're talking about five G interconnectivity of vehicles with low latency. You know, talking about a matter of um, perhaps one or two milliseconds now, as opposed to current four G, which is probably twenty or thirty milliseconds. So you know, things can be done in in real time now, and um, that is a there's a massive change. But coming back to this sort of reliability, um, you know, per se, um, you know, automotive systems um, really, really have, a, have an incredible focus on safety um, and reliability. So the testing that the automotive suppliers do is really phenomenal. Um, they really make sure uh, that the life of the vehicle is guaranteed within the parameters of their of their system. And I think in terms of electronics, uh, we talked about the CAF earlier on. Um, you know, the, man, the major manufacturers of these uh, of these uh, safety systems in vehicles have their own methods of testing uh, for 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 CAF, and they have their own test vehicles. And I say some of these now run at over a kilowatt, by the way. So you know, they are they are pretty advanced. So that that's coming along. But the other side of things, I think, is also quite interesting. You think about the uh, the camera in the vehicle. I mentioned before. The camera's doing a lot of things now. The camera's really very smart indeed. It's identifying objects, it's analysing the risk from those things, it's analysing the speed limit, what, what the hell is going on. Um, imagine, uh, imagine the case though where you buy a vehicle and using the traditional model we have today, you may own a vehicle for three years, five years. The vehicle life itself might be 20 years. That's a typical uh, li lifespan of, a, of an automotive uh, uh, well, a car, let's say. Um, you can't imagine that that, uh, that camera system that you buy in the vehicle today uh, would still be useful to you in 15 or 20 years' time. Think of your mobile phone, for example. I mean, nobody would be, would be seen dead with a phone, a mobile phone that was 20 years old with a camera from 20 years ago. It would be terrible. So there is a thought as well that as things move on, you'll need an upgrade path on the electronics in the vehicle. So you buy the vehicle uh, with the camera technology as it is today, which is pretty good. But imagine what it could be like in five years' time. And it may be necessary for your vehicle to have that improved capability in the vision system to live with all the other vehicles in five years' time. So probably you'll end up with a system whereby you don't just keep all the electronics in the vehicle in the same way that you have to change your tyres, you change your timing belt, you, uh, you may change uh, you know, some, other, some other parts, you change the engine oil and so on. Perhaps you'll also change the electronics as well. So perhaps there'll be a programme over one, two, three, five years whereby you bring the car in, they give you an upgrade and they upgrade the camera system, they upgrade the leader system that grade your collision avoidance systems to the latest technology and that'll be quite a big change um, because we just don't do that right now I don't know about you but you know you buy a car you know with a GPS system in five years down the line you know all the roads have changed and it doesn't really work anymore um, but that that won't be something that'll be um, uh, acceptable in the future because the vehicle will require the vehicle to X or the vehicle to vehicle knowledge and to be part of this broader infrastructure to improve our safety so therefore you'll need to make sure your car is up to speed and, and running at the right um, the right level of software and hardware in the future. So I think that'll be also a big, a big change in the on aviation, this journey. In the aviation towards... world, that's what's done now. I mean, uh, there are still right. planes flying from you know 30, 40, 50 years uh, ago, and and the cockpits get upgraded. Um, Collins Aerospace and other similar companies make a good living uh, building you know modern cockpits for older planes, and right. and you know the the systems are are brought up to date. Um, the, the analog instruments are gone, all all glass cockpits now, in in older aircraft. You know, I used to fly Cessnas uh, back in the day, and I, the only glass in that cockpit was the ones covering the analog gauges. You know, the, <laughs> that you tap when things get stuck. And sure. and now those same planes, the actual planes that I learned to fly on, which were all analog gauges, are now equipped with uh, with glass cockpits, uh, like. Tiny little, you know, uh, uh, Airbuses or Boeing's, but they're Cessnas, and and they have 
a Cessna version of very automated equipment in it, and it's it's the same point. We we don't do that with cars so much, but I I do I like that. No, point. we don't. I think that's no. coming. Mm. Yeah, we, we we add we add little features here and there. We may add some, you know, go faster stripes, or we may change bits and pieces. Like on our motorcycles, we do the same thing. But you don't really change the fundamental part of the uh, uh, the systems, and that's something that probably will uh, will come along. Um, yeah, so it's a good example actually, because um, you know what what aerospace does, uh, you know, could could well come forward to, to vehicles sure. in the same way. For example, uh, the the big airlines don't even own the the engines. The engines are leased from, uh, you know, from General Electric or from or from um, Rolls, uh, Royce Rolls Royce. Or, yes, and, exactly. and they they take care of them. You know, they basically say, okay, you can use the engine uh, every hour you you fly. It costs you whatever, but we take care of the whole thing for you. We bring the maintenance schedules. We'll take care of all the all the issues and the upgrades with it. So um, that again is a model that uh, that could well be applied to to automotive in the future but i think you know this is these are interim steps in the end we will have you know fully autonomous vehicles and that'll be a you know a step whereby um uh, all these features will have to be integrated and managed because you know i i do genuinely think the model of car ownership that we're so used to now will will come to an end at some stage um and that will be uh, will be quite an important uh, point for point for us but the the other point on the reliability in general i mean just going back going back a step um if we think um we think about vehicles and how much electronics is critical now to the function i mean i think in a vehicle now somewhere like 40 percent of the value or perhaps even slightly more now of the vehicle's value is electronics now so electronics are doing everything and as you said before if the electronics fails in a vehicle you can't even open the door you know everything sort of comes to a stop so it does become pretty critical and you certainly don't want your um, you know your stability control system to fail in the middle of a, a skid on ice on the on the freeway or something so there are elements there that have to be really uh, really well controlled and i think the point on the calf we discussed you know calf is a is an issue that um has been with us since the 1970s, or been known about since the 1970s. Let's explain what CAF uh, is, Alan, uh, for our So, uh, conductive inertic filamentation. Uh, basically, uh, you build a circuit, you build a system, uh, it runs, it works fine, and then suddenly, abruptly, it fails, and it fails completely. Uh, so you get a short circuit between two features on a, on a circuit board, for example. And what's happened is, um, the system has been exposed to, of course, uh, um, um, a bias, so there's a voltage gradient between two points on the board, so a plus and a minus. There's some temperature involved, usually, and there's humidity. What happens is uh, the humidity, of course, goes into the substrate, into the base material of the uh, of the printed circuit board that's being used. Um, within that substrate, there are also uh, some some ions available, so some conductive particles and bits and pieces that can be can be picked up by the humidity and dissolved by the humidity. So you form a kind of miniature plating cell, and the bias, of course, drives the um, drives the reaction. Temperature, of course, increases the rate of the reaction, and eventually a little filament grows from from the the anode to the cathode um, on the uh, on the circuit board or inside the circuit board and this is the filament grows and grows and grows and grows and uh, uh, like a plating cell basically until eventually uh, this pathway turns into a conductive uh, filament that actually shorts the circuit board out and that's conductive anodic filamentation that's the uh, the um, classic description of it so you need temperature you need humidity and you need bias you need voltage you also need a pathway um, and we of course conveniently provide the pathways because glass fibers um, within the substrates do form a very a very nice pathway between uh, conductive elements and we always have uh, ionic materials in there that can be um, that can be dissolved and, and mobilized by the humidity so there's always a there's always a potential for this to occur but of course um, if you consider going back so 20, 30 years, where electronics was generally held in, you know, in custody, uh, let's say, air-conditioned rooms, temperature, humidity controlled, uh, this this hardly ever happened. In fact, it, it just never happened in those situations at all. But you look at a vehicle. A vehicle works in the in the Arizona desert, and it works in the the ice of Finland. It works. Um, um, you know, in, in high humidity conditions, it works in pouring rain, it works in, in dry, arid des desert conditions. So it has the whole range of, uh, of, of, let's say, environmental conditions. And some of these, of course, conspire to, to give a higher risk of, uh, of, of CAF in a vehicle. Um, and of course, uh, you know, ca CAF can't be allowed um, in a vehicle in a safety critical system. The vehicle has to last for 20 years. It's designed that way and, and it mustn't fail. Um, so the the companies who supply this kind of uh, these kind of systems to vehicle uh, manufacturers have you know very very elaborate systems for uh, for controlling uh, CAF and for testing for CAF and CAF in the end um, the propensity towards CAF or the the tendency for it to occur comes down to three things one is the design 
one is the materials used and one is the process and all those three things come into play and certainly from the design point of view i think we all understand now uh, we're building systems smaller and smaller we're making smaller and smaller features the smaller and smaller the gap between anodes and cathodes the higher the problem or the bigger the problem you know when we had three or four millimeters uh, uh, or half an inch let's say between conductors this is no problem at all when you get down to you know 10 mils maybe five mils uh, this is becoming quite critical and we're certainly going that way more and more um, and that is, uh, as, is the real driver, I guess, for this. So over the years, there have been some solutions to uh, to improve uh, um, the performance with respect to CAF. One of the first things was purity of the substrates. So uh, in the early work in the 19, late 70s and early 80s, uh, quite a few impurities were found in the substrate. So there were lots of ionizable um, groups that could be mobilized and form the electrolyte, if, if you will. Um, these uh, were improved and over time uh, higher quality controls were placed on the raw material so that was a was an improvement then there was a phase where the um the main curing agent that was used was discovered as being not fully reacted in some uh, some systems uh, this was able to be dissolved by the humidity and again formed the electrolyte so that was replaced uh, with uh, a material that didn't uh, didn't have that effect so these things have been going on and on and on uh, to improve the uh, the performance for CAF, but on the other hand, you know, designs are still getting more critical, and environment vehicles are being used in is more and more critical. So this is a this is a never-ending story, and we have to continue to to work on this, and actually test, um, you know, test real systems. You know, you can't do a, a an exercise on a, on, a, on a bit of paper for this. You need to actually take the boards, uh, the design, and test via and test uh, coupons, and have them tested. And there are around the world some you know some very good test labs that do this testing on a very regular basis, um, and that's uh, that is a as an integral part of this uh, of this problem and the other thing i mentioned was process um, you also find you know process has a big impact on on calf performance you may have the same design you may have the same materials but a different process uh, can have a, a big impact on on the way the uh, the board performs a good example there would be for example um, you have a circuit board or circuit board company that um, that maybe uses a very aggressive uh, uh, edge back after um, after d smear so um, the the gap between two holes might be nominally uh, let's say uh, t 10 mils um, and they might actually um, you know aggressively attack the bond between the glass and the resin um, to take away perhaps a mil or two mils either side from that so when you thought you had a 10 mil gap you actually end up with a with a pathway that has to only span maybe six or seven mils and that could be quite a big issue um, so so process comes into it I have seen this I have seen uh, research work um, was involved in part of it some years ago whereby we compared three different board shops um, for the process using the same designs the same materials and the performance differences were, were massive you know they, they were as big as choosing a you know as choosing the material the wrong material so um, you know one should never forget that the process is an important part of this and that's why you see the um, you know the tier one automotive suppliers really take a very big interest in the in their suppliers the tier two suppliers of the printed circuit boards to make sure the process is controlled and understood and the process that they tested is the one that's actually being used in the in the design so it's quite a bit in there, uh, Mike, but it's a, it's a very deep topic. And, um, you know, I think it's one that, that does, you know, does warrant some attention. It's something that, um, you know, people may not fully understand, but it's uh, because of all these things, you know, the usage and the design, um, it really is it really is going to be a topic that will be on the table, I think, for years to come as well. As long as we have glass fibres, as long as we have potential to form pathways, we will have, uh, have calf concerns. Sure. I was uh, speaking with a friend and colleague, Judy Warner, who I know you know, um, I do, from yeah. Altium a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the this big disconnect. I was on her show, and I'm not a board guy, right? I, I'm I'm an assembly guy, and yet there is this huge chasm of this knowledge gap between the assembly folks and the board folks. You know, you're a foreign industry, you're an alien industry, <laughs> that, and somehow through this giant chasm, you hand me a product and I, I take it from you, but I really have no idea how it's made. And, and I know there's many exceptions to that statement, but as a generality, as a stereotype, um, you know, bathed in, you know, realism, um, that's true. And I, I, I was uh, working with a company, this is several years ago, my audience has heard this story too many times, so I won't, won't go into it in detail, um, where I was hired as an expert witness and it was a calf issue. Uh, and, and, you know, it, came, it became very clear that, you know, CAF is something that occurs within a board. Um, so one can say it's a board issue, even though there are things the assemblers can do to exacerbate the, the, the 
propensity of calf, you know, multiple thermal excursions, you know, lack of baking, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it's largely a, a board caused issue made worse by the assembler. Yet the, the assembly folks had no idea. They never heard of calf before. They had no idea how calf could be avoided. They had no idea that there were calf, more calf resistant materials from suppliers like yourself and, and others. Uh, they just had no idea about that. And, and I think the, the assembly people kind of blame the board people and the board people might do the, the same in return. I'm not sure, but there is this huge knowledge gap and it, it's really important from an assembly standpoint, particularly if a, a board is going into a harsh environment, you know, an automotive is like the poster child of harsh environment. Uh, if, if reliability is expected, if the cost of failure is high, then there really is an advantage to the assembly people, you know, communicating with the board people, with you guys, as to what the reliability expectations are and the climactic in-use environment that that board is going to see. Because otherwise, if they just put on their spec sheet, you know, FR4, <laughs> with, with no other slash sheet or no other bit of information in this cost-crazy um, world of 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 board fabrication where everyone just wants the cheapest board from delivered the fastest way. Um, you know, we, we lose the, the information that will allow folks like yourself uh, who can offer up a variety of different uh, board materials and, and, and production methods to, to adequately address the concerns of the assembler. You know, those conversations don't happen often enough. No, it's true, and uh, and you know, the more we do this, the better. I mean, I was I was um, you know, I wanted to to be invited to give a keynote at um, at the uh, Altium Live uh, events last last January. Judy, Judy invited me to that, and that was great. I did this, of course, on behalf of Ventec, and um, you know, I was able to explain in in the space of an hour. Um, you know, quite a bit about my knowledge. My knowledge is very is very shallow. Well, it's not very shallow. My, my knowledge is very is very specific. Um, it's around PCB materials, um, but it, you know, it goes pretty deep. And uh, the designers in the room, of course, don't know anything about PCBs or how they're made, uh, or about how the materials that go into them are made. Um, so, in the space of an hour, it's amazing how much knowledge you can you can you can pass just from your own experience. And I think that is the uh, the real thing we have to think about. Um, and you know, it's it's. It's not enough to just consider the PCB as a simple component. This is actually a very, very complicated component, and actually a component that you can uh, you can vary and, and, and specify in lots of different ways. I mean, I, I was involved in a case a few years ago where a board failed uh, for a CAF with an automotive supplier, and. Um, you know, the, the the board shop came came to talk to me, and we, we discussed around this. But of course, uh, the test they had applied to the board, the CAF test, wasn't disclosed to the board shop. So the board shop had no idea of the actual use case for the circuit they were they were building. Had they known the uh, the testing that was going to be uh, required, we could have specified a different material, and we could have passed the test quite easily. But because the um, the test wasn't communicated, um, you know, from the from the end user to the board producer, that discussion never, never took place. It was never mentioned, and that's the kind of thing that that's a disaster, really, because you know all the information is there. Um, you can get solutions to these issues, but you need to communicate together to to do that. You know, CAF is something that um, all manufacturers understand very well now. I mean, in Ventec, you know, we we have a, a a very a very keen focus on, on this and um and one of the most important things uh, when it comes to uh, um, eliminating calf or, or making materials more calf resistant is to watch how you how you treat the glass fibers the glass fibers uh, or the fiberglass that we purchase um, has a finish uh, there's a silane coating on there that's designed to to bond to the resin system so in the end we end up with this um, so-called siloxane uh, bond so silicon oxygen silicon uh, that actually gives you a physical so sort of chemical bond to the glass fiber which means that the pathways are very hard to form um, and of course in order to make this work you have to wet the uh, the glass fibers with the resin. Now you know there are there are systems, uh, very big, uh, fast running treaters that don't give much time to actually um, to actually cause the wetting to occur on the fibers. Uh, whereas whereas in Ventec that's been addressed and the the systems are designed to give more time and to actually allow the fibers to wet out fully. There are other other methods uh, used in there as well, but it's something that, that, that that's there's an awareness of, and that wouldn't have been the case uh, 20 or 30 years ago. I have to say. 
So those that have been investing in the in the recent past in new equipment understand this, and they will then select equipment that gives them this uh, this potential from at least an engineering point of view to get the wetting correct and, and give a better better performance. But yeah, I think the you know the number of it comes down in the end to communication, and um, you know just to be aware that there is an issue or potential issue is the first step. And you know I, I applaud the work that uh, that Judy is doing with his Altium Live events, and I'm sure the work that you've done as well to try to uh, try to communicate the requirement from the assembly through to the end user from the board shop supplier and also the supplier of materials to the board shop. All of us have a part to play in this and actually to get the right solutions we all need to uh, participate in this in this discussion. We can't just treat it as a, you know, uh, but, but buy the lowest cost item and specify it like you specify a resistor. It's not that simple. It's far more complicated than that and you can have far more influence on the, uh, the final performance uh, than, uh, than people might first of all imagine. That's right. Yeah. Uh Printed circuit boards are the foundation that we build our, our our livelihood on and our products on. And it, you know, when we build a house, we would never go for the cheapest foundation. You know, we we don't build upon sand; we build upon rock. And right. and right. you know that there are sandy boards and there are rocky boards out there to <laughs> carry that 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 lame uh, analogy out a little further. Uh, and and I, I think you know the industry would would really do itself a favor our industry, your industry, if we communicate more uh, as to what the reliability expectations are and the environment yes. that the boards are going to go in so we yes, can get exactly. the right materials the first time. And I've said this many times on this podcast, but that's just further you know, evidence of we don't have time to do it right, but we'll find time to do it over. You know, if, we can just, <laughs> if we can just not do it over, we just do it right. You know, and, right. And, and Because how much is failure? Failure is expensive in so many ways. And in, in, in actual yes. dollars and cents and, and pounds and pence and euro and all that and and in in reputation and, and some reputation of is, is a huge cost yes, it's huge absolutely. how do you put a price on yeah. that it's hard to yeah. quantify yeah. Um, it really is Alan you know, this has been a very important point. this has been a, a really fascinating discussion thanks for uh, being part of it and and I know a lot of this kind of went off the technical realm and we got to talk about you know everything from horses to steam engines <laughs> along the way, and sorry about and, that. <laughs> no, oh, I love it. I love it. I think that's what uh, that's what makes a great conversation. Alan, uh, if people wanted to get a hold of you for whatever reason, uh, what's uh, your email? Is it okay if I provide that? Yes, that's uh, Alan dot Morgan at ventec hyphen Europe dot com, or head over to LinkedIn. You'll find me there. Um, and it's Alan, A-L-U-N, Morgan. U-N, yes. yes. Yep. Um, so yep. if you type A-L-A-N, you're going to get some poor guy who's uh, uh, yeah, an accountant somewhere <laughs> wondering what CAF is. So Right. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the company you're representing is Ventec International Group. Uh, and they are a, a manufacturer of printed circuit boards. Uh, and Print circuit board materials. Uh, materials, yes. Oh, thank yes. you. Yes, of yeah. print circuit board materials. Um, going to the fab shops and uh, exactly yeah, so yeah, yeah. your product is probably already in our customers portfolio they just don't know it yeah, exactly it almost certainly will be yes <laughs> <laughs> very good all right well alan thank you it's been a, a great interesting interview thanks for agreeing to be my guest today that's my pleasure mike thank you for having me on well that's another episode thanks for listening to the reliability matters podcast don't miss an episode Subscribe to Reliability Matters on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast. Reliability Matters and other reliability-based podcasts are available at Circuit Assembly's PCB Chat at PCBChat.com and at Ascendo Reliability at Reliability.fm. Thanks for your comments. Please keep them coming. Send comments and episode suggestions to Mike at MikeConrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. Until next time, thanks for listening and keep doing it right. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.